We dried out and recovered and had a snack of K rations sitting around the gun. Some American MPs came to ask us for help. They needed help to guard Italian soldiers who were surrendering by the hundred. Several of our chaps went with them, including Nick, to the local football stadium, where the Italian soldiers were sitting in the sunshine, grinning happily to be out of the war. Benny and I went off to have a look around the town. It was still being strafed by German planes. Down one street we passed a tank that had just been destroyed by an American soldier with his bazooka. He told us they were short of bazooka rockets and ammunition, but they were unloading Coca-Cola and stores down on the beach. A military convoy was coming into the town from the invasion beach. German planes were strafing it. It stopped in the middle of the town's narrow streets. Benny and I were watching, standing by as the MP was watching as well. Up came a jeep swerving around the trucks on the pavement with an officer standing up and firing his revolver almost like a madman, somebody gone berserk. You can't shoot down German aircraft with revolvers. He stopped next to us and started to swear and curse and fire both guns at the same time. Then with no more bullets he turned to swear and curse in a range at the MP standing close by telling him to get the convoy moving and blaming him for the mess. This annoyed me and I yelled at him, leave him alone, leave him alone, it's not his fault the convoy stopped. It wasn't the MP's responsibility. All this time the noise of bombs and guns and planes was terrific. The officer stern turned and swore at me. I recognised who it was by the three stars on his helmet. It was General Patton. He recognised me, and I recognised him as well, but he kept yelling at me, God damn limey, son of a bitch. I told him he, he couldn't touch me because I was Royal Air Force and part of the radar. And I yelled at him to clear off, go and do something useful, this is no way to talk to your soldiers. Still cursing and swearing, God damn limey, son of a bitch, and so on, he went off fuming, still firing his gun with more bullets, all this time, I'd been pointing my sten gun at him, with a fresh clip of bullets. General Patton was an arrogant, bad-tempered, unstable character hated by his men and a very poor leader compared with Generals Eisenhower, Roosevelt and Allen. No wonder all his men disliked him so much. They called him blood and guts. It was everybody else's blood and his bravado or his guts. Next day, after a night on the concrete by the anti aircraft gun, with all the men, Benny and I went for a walk right up to the crossroads once more. We had coffee and some food to the MPs this time. Our, chips, our chaps were still busy taking turns to guard thousands of, of Italian prisoners by now, and the Americans were still being strafed by German fighters. They kept firing firing at us two on the beach. I decided to have a look at this gun to see if I could work it. Nearby I found a box of shells. I loaded one into the breech, swung the gun around at an ME 109 that was aiming at us, pulled the trigger, but nothing happened because there was no firing pin. Just at this moment Nick was coming back with an armful of water bottles. He'd found a tap near to the football ground with good drinking water. He sat down on the concrete gun base, dropped his sand gun vertically by his side. As we picked up our water bottles, we noticed a trickle of sand pouring out of the breech of his sand gun and told him. He'd been guarding thousands of prisoners with a sand gun completely full of sand which had been driven in by the heavy seas when he came ashore. Then I heard a voice. There's that bloody sergeant. Let's go over by the fig tree. That was a CO to his adjutant. It's the third time I'd seen him ever since I joined the unit. All the men took no notice of him at all as they were sitting on the, on the sand and by the gun. He ignored everybody, walked quickly past the gun to the edge of the safe area, stepped over the white tape into the minefield. He'd almost reached the fig tree 
when he trod on a tripwire which triggered off six landmines. Now we only had one officer left, our Canadian technical officer. This meant we were short of two radar controllers, so Benny and Ted would have to do their job controlling planes. Benny hurried up the road to the MP's office and told them to send down some medics with body bags and stretchers. All the men were still silent as the body parts were carried away. A few items remained. They'd be sent home or sent somewhere. So that was the end of our commanding officer. After the death of this commanding officer, his driver came down with Benny and we told him the situation and he took Benny and I down to the convoy that was getting set up on the plain of Jailer, just outside the town and a truck came up to get the rest of the men. We quickly set up the convoy as the picture shows. It's the first time we'd assembled it. We got in operations, we had everything going in about half an hour on this scorching hot plain. Sicily in the summer is not a very nice place. The fleas were in the, in, the, in the undergrowth and in the stubble and they started biting me straight away. So I filled my shoes with my army boots with diesel oil to keep them off my legs. We started operating almost immediately with Benny and Ted acting as controllers. By now, Allied planes were coming over Bombers were coming over from North Africa and Malta and we were directing them to the German airfields that we'd spotted. Once a German aircraft took off from the landing field on Jela, we knew the location. We could direct the bombers to fly over there and either strafe or bomb the runway. One pilot said it looked like a cemetery of German aircraft because within a few days Every airfield on Sicily had been decimated and the, the Germans lost well over a thousand planes in a few weeks. The radar cover that we had was excellent all across the island and way to the north towards Italy. We tuned in our radar station, the waves with Mount Etna, the volcano, at this 10,000 feet. On one occasion, on the second day, we had a panic not that we ever did panic. The Americans said the German tanks had broken through to the north and were driving down across the plain of Jela to divide the American forces. An American observer came charging down in his Jeep. In his Jeep he'd been told to smash up his radio set so the Germans didn't capture it. He did smash it up completely. The Americans, American officers in jailer, that's uh, Terry Roosevelt and Terry Allen, uh, could see the German tanks coming down the road from the north. They notified the Navy and the Navy, the British uh, monitor called the Abercrombie, started lobbing 15 inch shells and the American destroyers joined in as well and the, the naval bombardment put pay to the German advance otherwise they would have got right through to the sea. Well, after that things calmed down a little bit. The Germans were suffering very, very badly and they were starting to retreat. Well, we were busy directing aircraft to bomb the retreating Germans across the island for the rest of the month. And after a month, things began to ease up a little bit. <laughs> 